from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Four and a half months into 2024, and the fate of the farm bill is as uncertain as ever. We need a major restructuring now because of inflation, because of the fact for the last two years we've had the greatest drop in farm income in the last hundred years. Michelle Rook has the latest from a farm bill listening session. Planters are slow to roll in the east. The sins of planting will haunt you all season, and I think that is very, very true. So what mistakes should you avoid at planting? We're tapping into the knowledge of two of the best this weekend. That's Ken Ferry and Missy Bauer. Hogzilla versus Jaws. Shocking new research on the reality of deaths from wild pig attacks. Wild pigs are killing people at a rate, you know, two, three, four times that of sharks. Not just great whites, but all species put together. U.S. Farm Report, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the testing grounds meet the proving grounds. Pioneer, what's next happens here. We begin with breaking news out of Washington on Friday. EPA issuing an emergency fuel waiver to allow E15 gasoline to be sold during the summer months. EPA says current estimates indicate E15 is 25 cents a gallon cheaper than E10 and that this move will provide Americans relief at the pump. Now, this isn't unprecedented. The Biden administration took similar action the past two years. Under the Clean Air Act, the EPA administrator is allowed to temporarily waive certain fuel requirements to address shortages. As expected, renewable fuels groups applauding the Biden administration for allowing the use of E15 this summer. Can a new farm bill get done by the end of 2024? Some members of the Senate Ag Committee hearing say yes, and they talked about it recently at a farm bill listening session in South Dakota. Ranking member John Bozeman told attendees House Ag Committee Chair G.T. Thompson will release the chairman's mark in early May and has resolved the controversial SNAP changes. He says farm bill updates are needed to reflect today's market environment and tighter margins. That's why he says he and North Dakota Senator John Hoven introduced the Farmers Act to make crop insurance more affordable. And what we want to do is change crop insurance a little bit where, it's, where it helps everyone more, but also is more accessible to some of the regions of the country where they're not able to use it as successfully. Farm Bureau officials agree economic changes dictate a new bill and timing is critical before it gets caught up in politics. We'll have the latest on the debate surrounding the farm bill coming up in our Farm Journal report. Vilsack testifying before the Senate Ag Appropriations Subcommittee also giving his thoughts on the next farm bill. The secretary highlighting the loss of nearly 555,000 farms and 151 million acres of farmland the last several years as a reason to include farm programs for smaller farmers in the ag budget and new farm bill. Senator Hoven mentioned the farm bill. Obviously, uh, we are anxious to work with the Congress uh, to get that farm bill done, uh, but I think it's going to be important for us to focus in addition to productive agriculture, production agriculture, on agriculture that also benefits and increases income streams for small and mid-sized farmers because that's important to rural America. Vilsack also providing an update on the highly pathogenic avian influenza and stated that APHIS is working with land grants on virus transmission to mammals, vaccines, as well as treatment. Now the good news is there's been no negative trade implications so far. While we continue to watch for new, any new cases on avian flu in dairy cattle, there are new cases being reported in commercial flocks. Michigan officials reporting avian flu was discovered at a commercial poultry facility. They did not say how many birds were impacted. Currently, Michigan has two reported cases of HPAI in dairy cattle. And New Mexico is also reporting its first case of a virus in a commercial hatchery in Roosevelt County. APHIS did not say what type of hatchery was involved, but that more than 61,000 birds would be impacted. Until this week, New Mexico didn't have any commercial flocks affected during the outbreak. However, H5N1 has been confirmed in six dairy cattle herds in the state. That's it for the news. Well, we saw storms this week and then a cold front. We'll have a check of weather coming up next. 
U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. With five models ranging from 1,300 to the large 4,200 gallon and the ability to provide an excellent spread pattern, H&S has a top shot side discharge manure spreader to fit your operation. Find out more at the H&S website. Time now for a check of weather. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joining us this weekend. Matt, we started talking about it last week on the show. A cold front that was entering the picture late this week and into this weekend. But what is driving this burst of cold air that we're seeing right now? Hope you're doing well. As we go through the rest of the week, here's a look at the temperature outlook. And now a ridge of high pressure, as you'll see in a moment, will start to develop across the United States. Anytime we associate uh, warm air, typically you're gonna find a ridge, especially this kind of pattern, where it's not just one or two states, but very high chance of some heat and warmth back in Oklahoma and Texas, extending all the way up uh, to the Dakotas. Now, in terms of uh, how wide this warmth goes is all dependent on that ridge of high pressure. This is gonna be the main focus of the ridge, but we are gonna expand some of the above average temperatures back into uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, and over here towards Montana as well. Classic pattern where you have a low pressure system exiting, cooler than average conditions on the east coast and our next system starting to come in on the west coast so that's going to be cooler than average conditions there with the ridge in the middle so this is april 23rd through the 27th with those temperatures underneath that ridge may get some isolated showers but this is not a, a jet stream situation where we're looking at a widespread rainfall and severe weather especially as we get into the middle part of this week they're looking at more uh, wetter than normal conditions but nothing all the way to the right side of the legend here uh, more in this slightly above average but it takes up a good portion uh, of the united states i mean we could get some afternoon showers if not a rumble of thunder so here's a look at it monday tuesday and wednesday the jet stream remember those two things that i was talking about it got a trough that's going to try and dig down to the south. It's going to be very shallow in behind it. Again, remember where that warmth is setting up. It's right underneath the ridge or these white lines that scoot up here towards the north. Right down the center is where we have our highest chance of warmer than average conditions. Underneath that ridge as well, not going to see much in the way of widespread showers or heavy downpours. Still may get some showers here and there, but nothing like a, a tropical system or cause a flooding concern with this kind of pattern. Uh, as we looked at a little bit ago, you got the trough here exiting up to the top right corner of your screen, off to the northeast, and the other one back over here in the top left corner of your screen that's going to try to move down in and across the United States. These cooler temps, along with some heavy storm systems this week, seem to slow down planting progress. We'll talk about it in our marketing roundtable with Tommy Grisafi and Brian Split next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Well, as promised, we have Brian Split as well as Tommy Grisafi joining us for the show this weekend. Right, Brian, earlier this week, every Monday, we get those crop progress numbers from USDA this week's showed quite a bit of planting progress in the western corn belt starting uh, heavy on on soybeans as well eastern corn belt not as impressive but as you look at some planting delays that we're expecting to see in u.s growing areas into may do you think it's going to be that big of a market mover this year i don't um you know personally i try not to overanalyze the planting progress this early in the cycle uh, and I think back to a year like 2019, for example, where we had flooding through a large, large portion of the Midwest growing region. And the market was extremely complacent about that for weeks until they decided all of a sudden that it mattered. And we did have a sharp rally uh, at that point, but I just think it's too early in our planting cycle to get uh, worked up about some potential delays in Eastern Corn Belt when we're not seeing uh, planting delays in a, in a greater portion of the of the uh, growing region as a whole. Tommy, you know, when you look at where the moisture fell, it was in some areas that needed. We saw moisture in Kansas. We saw moisture in Missouri. We saw moisture South Dakota, Iowa. I mean, there were some storms that came through. It may delay planting progress, but it came at the right time. Yeah, you couldn't have said better. And we took a look at the drought monitor map uh, right before we record this here and uh, that little chunk of Iowa still has red that eastern part of Iowa but they had beneficial rain so give that drought monitor map 
a little bit of time to catch up. Historically, in years when we have that much white on the drought monitor map, it's all systems go. I believe this crop is one third the way made already and it's not even planted just by the moisture profile. Now, a lot of things can change as uh, Brian and you know, and the listeners and viewers that even back in 2012, uh, the great drought of 12, the market made a low at the very end of May and it started rallying then and it didn't stop. So be prepared for the market to have some volatility, but right now it looks like sideways to lower. Well, a lot of question marks about South America's crop, especially after the latest USDA report. But Brian, this week we saw South American crop consultant, Dr. Michael Cordonier. He raised his Brazilian soybean crop estimate 2 million metric tons. But then we saw Argentina's corn production um, get cut due to disease that's spreading in that area. You know, when you look at South America, is that story over or are we just getting started? Yeah, and, and back to Brazil real quick, there was not only revisions higher in, in this year's uh, soybean estimates, but also uh, last year's soybean estimates were revised by several agencies by about a million tons. But uh, to your question about Argentina, not only the USDA uh, attache to Argentina, but also the Rosario Grain Exchange have reduced their estimates from roughly 57 million tons down to 50.5 and 51 respectively. Uh, USDA is currently at 55. So um, that is still very much a, a, a talking point in the market, and it should be because we are losing production uh, uh, that the world is assuming currently that we're going to have. Uh, but the problem is, and you know, will the USDA come down to where these private estimates are? We've seen how slow the USDA has been to reduce Brazil's crop uh, based on where a lot of the private estimates are for Brazilian soybeans. We saw how slow the USDA was last year in reducing the Argentine uh, soybean crop when they had that historic drought. Uh, so even though the USDA is at 55 and, and there are four plus million tons above some of their, their counterparts in Argentina, I don't expect them to aggressively uh, reduce those estimates. So uh, it seems like the trade or the market as a whole uh, is more focused on what the USDA has to say than any of these other estimates uh, from uh, South American or private analysts. Well, as we continue to watch these estimates still come out, Tommy, you mentioned it with this rain, the way you see it, Basically, the, the crop, it's a third of the way to a record crop this year is how you put it. So let's say we do have a record corn crop this year in the U.S. We see those estimates in South America stay about the same. How low could prices go this summer, do you think, Tommy? Well, I only smile because I traded a lot of $2 corn in my career. I hope it's uh, not going to that level. But uh, we would easily see 299 cash corn across uh, many parts of America that have a poor basis. So a very bushel. The most expensive corn bushel you ever planted in your life, you may sell multiple dollars below your cost production. And although farmers always talk about their cost production in that cycle, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we are way past that cycle, being that the crop insurance period for the 23 bushels has ended. Uh, many expirations of futures and options have happened. Many farmers are going to turn 23 bushels into 24 bushels if they don't have a plan here in the next six weeks time. All right, Tommy and Brian, we're just getting this conversation started. We need to take a quick break and then we'll, we will be right back. Welcome back, Brian Split and Tommy Grisafi rejoining us. Okay, before the break, Brian, we were talking to Tommy about if we do see a record crop, we see rains this summer, how low could prices go? What are your thoughts? Uh, you know, I would correlate what's happening now to roughly 10 years ago and just to, to lay that footprint 2010, major low, 2020, major low. Uh, we went and screamed higher into 2011 highs, 2021 highs, ultimately culminating in 2012 with the drought, 2022, the invasion of Ukraine. 2013 and 2023 were both transition years from bull market to bear market. 2014, we made a new set of lows all the way down to 318 and a quarter after trading above $5 in May of that spring. Um, so when you take a look at our stocks to use potential estimates of a good crop uh, with the amount of acres that we're looking at planting, even that being a reduced amount, uh, the stocks to use of 17% or higher does suggest that we should see low to mid threes. So without a weather problem this year, uh, I do think it's entirely reasonable that December corn come uh, October may be down into the 320 to 350 range. Tommy, when you look at the spreads right now, the wheat spreads versus corn spreads versus soybean spreads, how are they acting? What are they telling us? In, in every way, they're telling us we have too much. But uh, the corn spread saying, hey, 
everyone, before you go plant your crop, we could use a little bit more corn to the cash market. The farmer is 100% in control of their crop. That doesn't mean the market's going to go up or down. When you look at the futures market, it's drifting lower. But when you look at the May-July corn spread and also look at the local cash market, your basis, there's been some really nice opportunities here. So, for example, someone who short futures and gets that pop in the cash market would really have a nice opportunity to sell the grain before planting here, take off those futures and move on in the marketing cycle time. Okay, speaking of lower prices, cattle markets, does it feel like we have hit a bottom here, Brian? Uh, it feels like we've hit a short-term low. Uh, when you look at both the June live cattle and the May feeder cattle, uh, both of those contracts achieved a 62% retracement. Uh, and that was from the December lows that were made to the recent highs. Uh, so we're talking, uh, you know, our, our March, uh, our, our February highs uh, in the feeders and our March highs in the live cattle. Um, now, the problem that I see is that maybe we get a little bit of a short-term bounce from these technical support levels. But uh, again, very similar to about a decade ago, uh, you think about 2014, we had major highs that were made, new record highs in fall. We had about three months of a break. Uh, and then we did rally for a few months after that. But what happened was when we eventually took out those those lows uh, that were made after that three months of break, it led to catastrophic losses. So the equivalent price level on our chart today would be roughly 160 to 162. That's that support zone. Uh, and if we do see these contracts trade below 160 later this year, uh, then I think this market is pointing down towards 130 on the live cattle. Um, so for live cattle, 160 puts in Dees and in Feb is something to consider. And likewise, bringing it back to corn and soybeans, uh, uh, 10 years ago, we made early lows in January that year. This year it was in February. When we took those out lows out later in the year, that led to catastrophic losses. So $4 corn puts in December and $11 bean puts on November beans, uh, those, that's catastrophe protection and, and probably uh, you know, good risk management warrants having that uh, there in your account, looking for some type of a summer rally to do some marketing. And then you leave those puts on for the long haul into fall. All right, Tommy, Brian, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. We need to take a quick break and then we're going to check in with Tractor Tales. That's next. Well, in Tractor Tales this weekend, one Pennsylvania couple is bringing joy to others. And it's all via an antique tractor. The name says it all. Rides for Smiles offers free rides to uh, seniors, kids, and our veterans. Rides for Smiles does just that, allowing every person a chance to experience the thrill of riding behind a tractor. Instead of a big hay ride, it focuses more on the individual. So everybody gets like their moment in the sun. The joy Rides for Smiles brings has amounted to nearly 300 rides over the course of three years. And the story behind all of that started when Steve Van Splinter was drawn to this 1941 Ford 9-in. It was really in rough shape when we got it. Non-running, flat tires, all of that. Uh, the paint was absolutely horrible. Uh, the carburetor was rusted shut from the collapse of the intake pipe, the air intake. Oh, it was a really nightmare, and uh, we put a lot of time into it. But after all that work, his wife had one simple question. We had the tractor fixed up, and my wife said to me, well, now you have a tractor, what are you going to do with it? Well, it's all up. So with that, they made a little cart to take their grandkids for a ride. Went around, and there was a, a little local girl riding her bike, and she was looking at the tractor, looking at the tractor, we said, hey, would you like a ride? She's like, yes. And she had the biggest grin the whole time and thought it was great. So we decided to give enjoyment to kids. And then it moved into seniors and especially our nation's vets and uh, all, all for free. The Van Splinters cover the expenses on their own, but donations are also a big help. And whether it's kids or local retirement community, this tractor is not only creating memories, but also sparking a few. There's people out there in that retirement community that it brings them back to memories of their childhood because they haven't rode on a tractor for a really long time. And some of them actually grew up with one. Rides for Smiles spreads joy with one event a month. And for Steve, it's personal. The mental health thing has to do with we've had struggles in my family, like a lot of others. 
with that, I had a, a friend that uh, passed away under his own idea, of, uh, which really wasn't fun uh, to deal with. Uh, the other thing is that we also like to do it, that we do it for free. A simple gesture that creates smile after smile and memories that extend for miles. If you'd like to support their cause, you can do so by visiting ridesforsmiles.org. When we come back, the fate of the new farm bill is just as uncertain as ever, and we're already four and a half months into 2024. Up next, we head to South Dakota to hear firsthand what changes farm bill listening sessions are trying to fuel. You're watching U.S. Farm Report, trusted, timely, tradition. The Ag Committees are pushing hard to get a new farm bill done this year, but what's the reality it gets passed and they will find the extra dollars to provide needed updates to farm programs? Farm Journal's Michelle Rook talked to members of the Senate Ag Committee to find out. At a farm bill listening session held here in South Dakota, Senate Ag Committee members expressed confidence that they can get the farm bill done yet in 2024 and they want to put more farm back in the farm bill. Ranking member John Bozeman told attendees House Ag Committee Chair G.T. Thompson will release the chairman's mark in early May and has resolved the controversial snap changes. What we'd like for him to do is go ahead. We want him to go first and then the minority side in the Senate, uh, what we will kind of do is come out with a framework very shortly after that. We've pretty much got that done. The idea is just to get a, a, a farm bill done this year. We need a major restructuring now because of inflation, because of the fact for the last two years we've had the greatest drop in farm income in the last hundred years. That's why he and Senator John Hoven co-sponsored the Farmer Act to make crop insurance more affordable. And what we want to do is change crop insurance a little bit where it's where it helps everyone more but also is more accessible to some of the regions of the country where they're not able to use it as successfully. The crop insurance industry supports the bill because it will replace disaster programs. What we would like to see is getting away from all the ad hoc disaster money that's been out. There's been about $65 billion that's gone out for ad hoc disaster that really didn't help a lot of our producers. Senate Ag Committee member John Thune says they also need to put more farm back in the farm bill. The nutrition title, for example, um, the climate issues, that's become a big priority for a lot of uh, uh, particularly Democrats on the on the Ag Committee and more generally in the Senate. So um, when we say that, what we're talking about is those parts of the farm bill that focus on production agriculture. Beyond preserving crop insurance, the Soybean Association is pushing for an increase in the reference price, which is at only $8.40 per bushel. Yeah, that reference prices at this time are just well below what they should be. As we've seen back when we had trade wars and whatnot, and we saw a significant decrease in the price of soybeans, we never triggered a loss in, in terms of those reference prices. Corn growers echo that, plus want updated base acres. Those base acres are based off data from what our grandpas used to plant. And now that the corn belt has moved west and north, we need those to you know reflect of what's actually being planted out there. While this will cost more money, the senators are pushing for the needed changes. I think that there's more likely you'd something done on reference prices. I mean, that's expensive too. Uh, if we went to mandatory, updating mandatory base acres, I think you would get actually savings that you could apply, but it's also incredibly controversial. Livestock and dairy producers also want enhancements in insurance products to reflect the state of their industry. The DMC uh, is is at five million pounds. Uh, we definitely would like to see that increase. That's 250 cows, 300 cow dairy. Uh, the average dairy herd in South Dakota is 1,500 cows. Bozeman says only $300 million of the $1.5 trillion bill goes to Production Act. 80% goes to nutrition, so they must find extra funding, perhaps in the CCC. I think that's a viable option. Uh, he's a lot of money's being spent in the CCC, a lot, of, a lot of money left over. 
Farm Bureau officials agree the farm economy has changed since 2018, making it urgent to pass the bill before it's embroiled in politics. We need to get it done now because there's so many other things coming along, like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act expiration that's going to happen in 2025. That's going to be a big issue politically, and, and we don't want to have so many big things going on at one time. Plus, he says this is a food bill, and food security is national security. I'm Michelle Rook for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle. Well, all of the Washington insiders that we've spoken to expect the process to continue to be slow as there's still debate over how the committees will find additional funding. Well, when we come back, new tariffs on China, and it's not being proposed by Trump. This time, it's President Biden. Ag Around the World is next. Now for a glimpse of Ag Around the World, one major trading partner may be about to see tariffs increase. President Biden announcing he's considering tripling U.S. tariffs on steel from China. The president making the announcement in an address to steel workers in Pennsylvania yesterday, saying he wants to better protect American producers from Beijing's industrial overcapacity. The White House insists it is more about shielding American manufacturing from unfair trade practices overseas. Right now, the Census Bureau says only about 3% of imported steel over a 12-month period came from China. And taking a closer look at China's economy, Beijing says it picked up speed at the start of 2024. First quarter gross domestic product grew 5.3% from a year earlier. And as Mark Stewart reports, it's outpacing analysts' expectations. Let's start with some context. It was just about one month ago when government leaders here in Beijing unveiled an economic growth target of about 5% for 2024. Some see that as ambitious. This latest report, though, on the health of the Chinese economy is very much in line with that target. But there are some questions about whether it can be maintained, sustained into the future. If we look at the data, manufacturing is a big part of the success. And in China, there are really three big industries right now, electric vehicles, solar panels and batteries. And being based here, a lot of this is something that I have seen firsthand. Yet, as we've heard from economist Harry Murphy Cruz from Moody Analytics, quote, there's a growing mismatch in China's economy. Manufacturers are doing the heavy lifting while households sit on the sidelines. And there's concern China is flooding the market, essentially adding so much merchandise, negatively then impacting pricing, making it difficult for others to compete. It's an issue Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen talked about during her visit here just last week, a practice that can prevent a level playing field. In addition, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz met with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. And before that, the German Chancellor expressed concerns among similar lines, according to Reuters. Finally, the bigger issue, China is still fighting economic headwinds, including problems with the property sector, an issue that still lingers and could prevent future growth. Mark Stewart, CNN, Beijing. Well, grain production in Ukraine has remained unprofitable since the Russian invasion, and that's expected to translate into decreased production this year. That's according to a new USDA grain and feed report from the country's attache. This one graphic tells the story. It shows what average profits were like before the war, that's in blue, and what started to happen in 2022 following the invasion in red. Since that time, farmers have accrued losses for almost all major bulk commodity crops, except for oil seeds, for two consecutive years. The report also suggests that only oil seeds will be profitable for this year. It says while grains remain in negative territory, that has naturally impacted farmers' planting decisions for this season, with winter crops estimated to be down nearly 9 percent. Farmers also plan to increase spring wheat and barley while decreasing corn. Well, up next, an ag trade mission to India is on the docket. What's on the line? Chip's Corner is next. Time now for Chip's Corner. Well, starting on Monday, USDA Undersecretary Alexis Taylor will lead a trade mission to India. She will lead a delegation of 47 businesses and organizations, along with officials from 11 state departments of ag. It's being seen as a major effort to build trade relations with India. Agritalk's Chip Flory, you had a chance to speak to Taylor ahead of that trip this week. Yeah, absolutely. I had a great opportunity to have a conversation with Alexis Taylor, the USDA Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Affairs. 
58 different individuals and organizations, Tyne. Talk about herding cats, and you're putting them all on one uh, on, on one transport into India to talk about trade with with a country that holds a lot of potential for the the for U.S. trade going forward, but has been a very difficult partner to build a relationship with in the past. So we asked uh, Undersecretary Taylor, how exactly are you going to make it happen? How are you going to build that relationship? For those nearly 25 businesses, um, we will set them up with importer meetings, um, almost like speed dating, where they will have an action-packed, jam-packed uh, meeting schedule to ha- showcase their products, make relationships, and either it maybe expand if they're already exporting to India, or build those first-time relationships and get sales on the ground. Um, we know this works. Uh, I just came back from Korea, where I led a trade mission, and what we had is um, $70 million in projected 12 month sales coming out of those nearly 600 business to business meetings. Right. Yeah. We know this works. Did you hear her say that? That that I think is very important. And you know what, Tyne, it better work. Uh because these trade missions are the trade policy of the Biden administration. And it's not like there are major negotiations happening to create free trade agreements with multiple countries around the world. It is the one-on-one conversation that the Biden administration is relying on to build trade relations. Now, it's not that different than what the Trump administration had in place. And going forward for the next four years, I I, I think it's something that, that agriculture had better get used to. And I don't know how happy ag is because – For the first time in fiscal year 2023, we've got an ag trade deficit in this country, $16.7 billion. And a lot of ag traders would just assume that we flip-flop that trade balance going forward. Well, and one of the criticisms has been that with the Biden administration, we've seen their trade policy pretty much stuck in neutral. But Chip, this week, President Biden announcing he's considering tripling U.S. tariffs on steel from China. Yeah, President Biden was never interested in removing the tariffs that President Trump put in place on China, Uh, the Chinese steel and aluminum in particular under the Section 301. Those tariffs are going to remain in place. And just through the the policy of the U.S. and attitude, I guess, toward China, we continue to see a pattern of retaliation from China to U.S. agriculture in particular. They've gone to Brazil for corn and soybeans now, and it's going to take a lot of work to get that demand back in the U.S. I have a feeling we'll be talking about this more as we get closer to the election. Chip Flory, host of Agritalk. You can catch him twice a day. That's Agritalk AM as well as Agritalk PM. Thanks so much, Chip. All right. Planting, it's at a standstill for some, but an impressive planting pace for others. But what are the sins that you can make during planting? We're going to ask two of the best. Ken Ferry, Miss C. Bauer, they join us next. Well, as we showed you earlier, planting is happening at an impressive pace in the West. In the East, it's off to a slower start, and with more rain this week, the waiting game may be extended a little longer. So what are the sins at planting you should try to avoid? We reached out to our resident crop whisperers, Ken Ferry and Missy Bauer, to find out just that. Planting is off to a solid start in the West, and in the East, more moisture is creating a slow start. But deciding when to plant is a crucial decision every year. I was once told uh, when I was at Purdue at school that the sins of planting will haunt you all season. And I think that is very, very true. Farm Journal agronomists Missy Bauer and Ken Ferry have decades of data to help farmers make the best decision when it's time to go. And Bauer says there are several things to consider. But one of the most important is making sure each planting pass is perfect. This planting pass, am I taking time to make sure I'm digging and making sure my depth and down pressure is set right? My closing wheels are doing what they should. So those final decisions out there in that planting pass is very critical. Ken Ferry is based in Illinois, and he says one of the biggest mistakes he sees is farmers not checking their planting settings enough by digging behind the planter. 
dad and grandpa, they spent a lot of time on their knees behind the planter, probably in every field, multiple soil types within the field. We don't have to spend as much time on our knees as they did because we have some fantastic technology on these planters that we can monitor from the cab. We can monitor smoothness of ride, depth, moisture, all these different things that we can measure. But Ferry points out sometimes monitors don't indicate the problem or farmers ignore the monitor altogether. Something I've learned, if the monitor is walking at you, figure out what it is because usually it's right. But if we get off and we get behind the planter and we're digging and we're looking at that furrow, we're looking at the closure of the furrow, the pack of the furrow, the seed placement, and we're ground truthing it, that makes it uh, a lot less likely that we're going to have a train wreck. He says timing is also key in making sure the soils aren't too wet. If we're going out there and pushing it, we're going to put in a compaction layer. And that compaction layer just keeps on giving all season long. So the service calls that I go on in June and July, 80 to 90 percent of the compaction issues I have to deal with with our customers come from the first pass that they're getting pretty nervous right now to make. The first pass is where most trouble comes from. But what we found is soybean planting dates are very critical. I have an opportunity to add a lot of bushels with early dates. So even when I plant early and it takes a long time for the beans to get out of the ground and I lack maybe some uniformity emergence in, in, in the field, but what I gain and the yield side of it out trumps that. We've learned that if we can get these beans planted early enough, we can get some pre solstice flowering. Last year we had flowering on some of our early beans by May 27th. When you consider the solstice at the 21st of June, that's, that's pretty good. And that usually brings along a premium in yield. We need about 950 growing degree days before the solstice. And when we're talking about group four beans, we need about 810 uh, on our group threes. Both Barry and Bauer say it's the opposite case for corn. If I plant corn early and things don't come up uniform or it takes 14 or 20 days to get your corn out of the ground, We've just heard our yield potential from the get-go. So if you want that uniform stand well, with the photo finish of, of plants being very uniform and photocopied and ears being there, you need to be planting in conditions that are going to allow that to happen. So it's going to be warm enough, above 50 degrees, so you don't fight seed chilling while that seed takes on and imbibes water. Bauer says in her area of southern Michigan, farmers have waited to plant corn until the 10th to 15th of May and still reached record corn yields. But on soybeans, seed treatments have been the ticket to push the envelope on planting dates there. The seed treatments are really good. We, we've done a lot of plot work where we can plant beans and maybe it is, it is cold after that initial first drink of water maybe being warm. And it's cold for, for a long period of time and it might take 25 or 30 days to get the soybeans out of the ground. But we can still be at 90% target populations because the seed treatments are so good today. Whether you're itching to plant or worried about weather, mistakes now can cost farmers big yields months down the road. Now we also have an entire playlist on our Farm Journal YouTube page dedicated to planting tips from Ken. You can find those with the QR code on your screen. All right, shark attacks may be scary, but there's an animal more deadly that's also a major nuisance for newly planted crops. We have details and from the farm next. If you were guessing which animal's more dangerous, wild hogs or sharks, which would you guess? Well, new research is answering that question. And according to a startling new study from researcher John Mayer, wild pigs kill more people each year than sharks do by a wide margin. Take a look at this. From 2014 to 2023, the average yearly number of fatal shark attacks worldwide was just under six, while the average number of fatal wild pig attacks was more than three times higher at nearly 20 per year, including seven deaths by wild pigs already in 2024. Farm Journal's Chris Bennett digging into the strange but true statistics. Wild pigs are killing people at a rate, you know, two, three, four times that of sharks. Not just great whites, but all species put together, according to John J. Mayer's research. And, and, and certainly, I don't want to discount in any way, you know, the deaths by tigers, uh, crocodiles, venomous, steak, venomous snakes. Those all surpass wild pigs. But when you compare wild pigs to sharks, to wolves, uh, to bears, for example, as, as Mayer did, wild pigs rank above all of those. 
And it's not just deaths. Wild pig attacks are even more common, with 1,532 verified attacks from 2000 to 2019. That resulted in 172 human deaths in 29 countries, and nearly 40 percent were farm workers or people engaged in agricultural activities. There's not a fleet of wild pig attacks on humans occurring, but Mayer's research is very noteworthy because it shows a clear trend where these attacks are going up. Maybe that's because they're being documented and noted now. That remains to be seen. While a naturally defensive animal, wild pigs can be aggressive when cornered. Once set on confrontation, these animals are extremely dangerous. And you're talking about an animal that can move, you know, 25, 30 mile per hour in, in short bursts. Uh, it, it's, it's a wad of muscle, massive amount of muscle on the neck and shoulders. You've got tusks, it's particularly long enough on the males on the bottom that are razor sharp on the sides. The average wild pig weighs 240 pounds and 86% of attacks happen in daylight. But where you live does make a difference. According to Mayor, more than half of all fatal pig attacks occur in India, followed by China at 8%. And in the U.S., we have six recorded fatalities in the past 100 years. You have to check out Chris's full story on this. You can do that by heading on over to agweb.com or visiting the QR code on your screen. Well, that does it for U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to tune in again next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.